Welcome to the Divorce Survival Guide podcast, where we have open and honest conversations about co-parenting, separation, divorce, and the hardest question of all, should you stay or should you go? I'm Kate Anthony, your Divorce Survival Guide, and I'm here to help you navigate some of the roughest waters you've ever swum in and answer some of your toughest questions. I've been to hell and back, and now it's my mission in life to help you get to the other side of this process with your sanity and your heart intact. Welcome back to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. I hope you had a phenomenal Mother's Day. Whether you had to plan it for yourself or you actually had someone honoring you, I hope it was wonderful. I had a great time. My dad is here. I haven't seen him in almost two years, thanks to the Rona. And it was his 80th birthday. So we had a big party. We actually had, I had people over, all of them vaccinated. But there was a gathering of 10 people in my house for the first time in over a year. And we were hugging and getting to celebrate my dad. It was just really special. That was mine. And I hope you guys had a really nice one as well. Today on the podcast, I am so excited to bring you my conversation with Dr. Shafali. You may know her from Oprah, but today you're going to hear her here. Dr. Shafali, for those who don't know, is an incredible New York Times bestselling author. Her two landmark books are The Conscious Parent and The Awakened Family. If you have not read those books, go get them. She's actually here today to talk about her new book, A Radical Awakening, which is very exciting. Dr. Shafali received her doctorate in clinical psychology from Columbia University, specializing in the integration of Western psychology and Eastern philosophy. She brings together the best of both wor worlds for her clients. She's an expert in family dynamics and personal development, teaching courses around the globe. And as I said, she's written four books three of which are New York Times bestsellers. And Oprah has endorsed her work as revolutionary and life-changing. So it's really exciting that she came on today to talk to us, to talk to me about her new book, A Radical Awakening. And I... I'm just, I'm a little bit gobsmacked. She's one of those people that I got I was a little starstruck <laughs> at having Dr. Shafali on my podcast. So deeply honored. And without further ado, here's my conversation about a radical awakening with Dr. Shafali. Dr. Shafali, thank you so much for coming on and talking to us. I'm excited to be here. It's such an honor, really, truly. And you have a new book coming out. Yes, I do. It's called A Radical Awakening, and it's really designed for women to break free of their you know, fear-based patterns and find the courage to live their most authentic selves. That's amazing. And also we hear that a lot. And I know that you're not the average surface type. When you talk about living your authentic, being your authentic self, you actually mean that on a very holistic and deep level. This isn't about- no. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was worried about that when I was writing this book, I said to myself, why would this book be different? There's so many raw- be you kind of books. It's the t t sign of the times, right? How is this book going to be different? What is it going to offer women that is going to be such a different message? And I think because I'm a clinical psychologist and have I do this every day with women, taking them through the journey, and I express my own journey in this book, it's really not just a motivational, be positive kind of book. It's a process to heal yourself kind of book. And I guarantee that most women who pick this up and do this book in earnest, go through every page and reflect and use it as a stepping stone, will end this book in a different place that they, than they began. Not just a motivational, positive psychology book. It's really a journey that I take women on 
and show women all the glitches and all the chinks in their psychological armor that have kept them from daring to speak up. Really, at the end of the day, it's just fear that paralyzes us. And we give the authority to these other people in our lives, be it our husbands, our partners, our mothers. And it's it's just the wake up call we need to understand that and understand why we've done it. It's, that's where this book goes deeper. Why are we giving up our power every single day of our lives to food, to substances, to competition, to comparison, to self, to self-esteem issues, to self-loathing? And once you understand why you are giving that up, now the next time you do it, you're going to take a pause. You're going to take a detour. Yes, Amen. And that's, I think that's everything. And I think for women, as you talk about in your book, being we, the cultural conditioning, which is something I talk about ad nauseum, my audience is going to be like, there she goes again, but here we go again. This is the, the cultural conditioning that women have been raised into. Yeah. And if we don't see it and name it, we will forever be devoured by it. So I also go on and on about the lies culture tells us. It's like our daughters looking at a cosmopolitan magazine cover and thinking that's how women are supposed to look. And then we debunk that and we tell them, no, that's Photoshop. This is not true. This is surgery. Why do we do that? Because we want them to understand Don't get oppressed by this image of perfectionism. It's not real. It's an illusion. So that's what this book is really about. It's lifting the veils of our illusions and waking up to the fact that we've been really, uh, the whole first section of the book is called Asleep in the Matrix. And we've been asleep. And waking up is the first step. And it's a rude awakening, really, because you realize your whole life, you've been a real Fool, really ignorant. And I say this with compassion and humor. I was a certain definite fool for the first 44 years of my life, oh. <laughs> thinking I needed. <laughs> yeah, same. Hi. <laughs> Absolutely. Certainly in my 20s and 30s. Because we we believe that, we believe in things that we didn't know we were not supposed to believe in. If only someone had not put those dumb beliefs in our minds, we won't even have a struggle. But Culture does that. It puts these dumb beliefs into our children and our minds as children. And we think that's the way to be. And I'm sorry for calling them dumb. I I want to make them seem as much of an illusion as I can. So sometimes I use the word dumb. Today I'm using the word. (laughs) Tomorrow I use the word cunning. And then I use the word seductive. It's just to point out that they are, they're, evanescent they are vapor they are they're they're thin air they're not real Mm -hmm. and we Mm -hmm. we believe them as if they're real and i want to scream to the world and go they're not real they're not real the emperor is not wearing clothes and so what is it that's not real what's not real it's not just the magazine covers it's the these are the lies that you uncover in the later chapters of the book you go through these lies which are amazing i want to get to those in a minute i want to wait because we're jumping ahead so let's talk about what you said something on an interview with Oprah that you were talking about the childhood abduction of our authentic self. And I was just, that phrase just stabbed me in the heart because that's right. We, this is how we lost our authentic selves. Most of us don't know what that means. If I said to you or to someone listening, what is your authentic self? They'd probably be like, like a deer in the headlights. I, I, I don't know, but why don't we know? Because if this abduction <laughs> that you call it. This, this heist that occurs in childhood where we are robbed of our discovery. Childhood is not a discovery process. In every coaching session that I do, I'm sure you do this too, we have to go on a discovery process with your client. You can't just prescribe them the treatment, but that's what childhood is. It's a prescription and it is not a discovery. And because it's not a discovery and it's a prescription, things are handed down as as divine truths and sanctimonious norms and values by our higher power to bees in our families or culture or clergy, whatever. And we think that they are sanctified by some divine ordained being. And because we are told that we got to follow it or we will risk 
validation, risk worth, risk love, risk belonging. That's always the subscript, right? Follow or suffer. So we began following. And with every following and every passing year, we moved further and further from the discovery. And the discovery was going to allow us to manifest, express, and mirror our authentic knowing. But we never did that discovery process. We were abducted from that whole process. We were told this is the way to be. Prescription number one through 172. And somewhere around 65, middle of the list or whatever, 45, we realized that mm, happiness is not coming. In fact, I'm going deeper and deeper into some dysfunctional patterns. And I'm not feeling the lightness of being that my parents promised me. Where is the reward? And when you have kids and you've been so diligent and you've been skinny and you've been doing everything you can and you're still a big mess, then maybe you wake up and go, was I given, was I given a prescription list that was an entire lie? Yeah. I, I had that moment when I was, I think I was 28 when I had the moment where, and I, the image that I really had when it happened was that I had been living in a cardboard box, which was the prescription that you talk about. And that suddenly I was starting to peek my head out of the cardboard box and realizing, holy shit, that reality was not, is not reality. That's just what I was prescribed based on being raised by a single mom. I had one input. And so it was just her reality was became my reality. I didn't know any different. I didn't. And you, when you have that moment of lifting your head out of that cardboard box and recognizing there's a lot more that I actually have can choose. I actually have autonomy and I have choice. It's liberating. It's terrifying, right? Yes. It is so terrifying first, at first. It's literally having lived in a bunker and now you realize there's a whole, you know, world out there that you had no idea about. Because again, we were conditioned by those inputs. Whatever our inputs were, we thought that they were the, the only way to be. And that's what we do to our children when they're young. We fake it we because we know it's not the only way to be, but we want them to follow our ways to be so that it's convenient for us. So we pretend to our children, this is the only way to be. (laughs) And we're like, hell, this happened to us. We turned out, okay, let's just do it to our children. And we call it tradition and we romanticize tradition, but actually it can very quickly become boxes, cages, and nooses around our neck. Mm -hmm. And this is your first book. This is the subject of your first book, right? Your, uh, or maybe it's not your first, is it your first? I don't even know, but your parenting book. First parenting book I wrote called The Conscious Parent speaks to this, how we parents abduct our children. And then I wrote three more, four more books on parenting. And this is my fifth book. And this one is specifically for the liberation of the woman. Yes. Which we all need so much. Yeah, because she's the mother and she's the caretaker and the nurturer. And even if she doesn't physically bear children, women are the connectors. So if we are disconnected from our own essence, we're not going to really be able to connect to anyone. Yes. I want to talk about that. I want to talk about the hamster wheel, right? The crazy making in women's heads that they are doing it all and a majority of time we are, right? We're, we're raising the kids, we're working, we're keeping a perfect house or we you know, try to, we're trying to be sexual beings, we're whatever, all of it. And we have this, I have so many friends that are like this, that just, it's a loop and it's frenetic and it's crazy making. And you have an, I think you have an interesting insight as to why women do that and where it stems from. Yeah, we are doing that because on one hand, we've been told for so long, we can't have it all. So now we're rebelling and we're like, we are going to have it all. But we don't see that we're just reacting because in our fervent, rabid desire to have it all, we're burying ourselves under a new set of exhaustion and burnout. But I understand why we want to have it all because for a long time, we couldn't have it all. So now that we can, we're just like greedy and but we are putting so much pressure on ourselves to have it all. Now we're going the other way and we're torturing ourselves because we want to do it all, be it all and have it all. Guess what? Suppression wasn't the answer. 
And over craving is not the answer either. What has been missing from the real dialogue is our empowerment. We should never be suppressed and never should we also oppress ourselves with too much perfectionism. All we need to do is stand in our power of our inner worth. When we come from inner worth, we neither suppress nor do we run and chase and beg and try to do it all either. Who wants to do it all? I'm at that place in my life. I don't. Good I don't God. even know what that means anymore. Yeah. I just want to be real. I want to be relaxed. I want to be in flow. And I don't want to prove it to anybody anymore. Yeah. In my own therapy work, I've been doing a lot of work on rest and what that means and what that looks like. And I'll tell you, it is blowing my mind. It's because we're not taught how to rest. We come from hustle culture and, you know, and doing it all and having it all. And women aren't supposed to rest. We've just replaced doing it all for other people to now trying to do it all for ourselves. But it is still coming from hunger. It is still coming from a place of lack and scarcity. And as long as we come from lack and scarcity, it doesn't matter who we're doing it for. It's still inauthentic. Yeah, rest is such an amazing idea. And really, rest doesn't have to be laziness on a couch. It's taking a break from the hunger and the hustle and the constant need to prove ourselves. Take a rest from that. Don't be the best, the mom with the best cookies and don't be the mom with the best hairstyle and don't be the woman who's trying to be the skinniest and, the, and wear the best outfits. Don't be that. Take a rest from that because that is what is exhausting you. And all of that trying to be and do and have and that hustle is so much a symptom of what's going on in the internal world right? It's this outward manifestation of this inner turmoil. And we think that getting skinnier, that having cleaning up the house, that having perfect kids, all of that stuff is going to solve that inner turmoil. Exactly. Now, listen, there is always a, a tug of war between our inner being and culture, right? Culture is always telling us to dress a certain way and to be perfect. And but we have to resist culture and we have to draw the line. So I love to get ready to get ready, meaning like overdo it, put some makeup. I, I like all that crap too, but I limit it like a kid in a candy store. I tell myself, okay, the day before you can begin to think about what you want to wear. It doesn't warrant more than a few hours before the event. Now, somebody will say, are you crazy? What if I don't have what I don't have? And I say, Nothing is so important. And I've gone for Oprah interviews and my friends can tell you I've gone shopping the day before because I tell myself what is so important that I will not find the day before. When I got married, I remember telling my mother, okay, we will start going crazy two weeks before. This doesn't deserve more than two weeks of madness. I'm not going to go mad for a year. So it's putting these stop buttons for ourselves and not allowing ourselves to pander to cultural fears. Culture tells us we need to plan a wedding for a year. Culture tells us we need to care so much about our hair and makeup. Culture tells us we need to wear. No, but we need to know ourselves and go, okay, great culture. I'll do a piece of it within limits. Mm -hmm. And I think we, in our hunger for validation, we somehow don't have limits. There's no end we want to go to, to be amazing. And we have to accept that we are Ordinary, just like I tell parents to accept that for their children. How amazing can we be? We're putting such unattainable standards of amazing on ourselves. And mm -hmm. we've forgotten the good enoughness of the good enough. Good enough is amazing. I want my kid to be good enough. I really don't mm -hmm. have greater fantasies than that. I want my kid to be happy and feel fulfilled, whatever that yeah. looks like. And if she's not happy... There were times in your life you were not happy, but they actually but they actually took you to great insight and learning and evolution. So pain, as I talk about in this, it's the first subtitle, it's called Turn Pain into Power. Like we cannot avoid pain. I'm not going to wish for my daughter to have a pain-free life. That'll be setting myself up for an unattainable expectation. And also I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I know. What a boring life that would be. Wait, absolutely. How absolutely. Are you not gonna, right. How are you not going to break up 
at least 10 times in your life? How are you not going to have failure at least 10 times in your life? So it's, do you want to live or do you want to live in a plastic cage and never feel? Right. Yeah. My goal with my son is to have him give him the sort of fortitude and the insight and the understanding of how to go through those things, not to avoid them, to know that he can talk to me, to know that there are options out there available to him for therapy or whatever, or just his own introspection and insight. Absolutely. That's the way to go. And now we're going to take a quick break to hear from our sponsor today. Today's sponsor is Soberlink. Now, the Soberlink system is designed to make parenting time safer with real-time remote alcohol monitoring. Soberlink uniquely combines a breathalyzer with wireless connectivity and is the only system that includes facial recognition, tamper detection, and advanced reporting. Parents can submit a test anytime, anywhere, thanks to Soberlink's wireless technology, which delivers test results by text message or email to the concerned parties. Simplify co-parenting arrangements by using the system that provides transparency and proof of sobriety throughout the day. Flexible schedules combined with real-time delivery of results make Soberlink the experts in remote alcohol monitoring technology. And for limited time, get $50 off your device by emailing info at soberlink.com and mentioning the Divorce Survival Guide. And now back to our show. So we keep talking about doing the inner work and you have to become, you have to get to this place to be able to blah, blah, blah. And I think everyone wants to know, like, how do you do that? (laughs) Like, (laughs) how, how do you do that? Yeah, yeah. It's so the how is in the picking up a phone and calling somebody who does this for a living, right? Just if you want to train your body for a movie you're going to be in, you're going to call a a coach. You call a therapist, you call someone like you or take one of my courses or people who do this work. We do this work because we are- There's a lot of us out there. We are trained to help you. So there's no shade, there's no shame in saying I need help, number one. Number two, it's- making a declaration, a commitment to yourself that you truly want a better life for yourself. I think the only person who stops us is our own inner oppressor, our own inner saboteur. We have been sabotaging ourselves. Nobody is standing in our way, but they're all in our head. And we need to empty out the toxicity that we have indoctrinated and the diet, the mental diet has to change. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. In asking for help, women are probably better at it at this point because we're, we are culturalized to turn to each other. At least we seek out personal development and therapy more often than men do, unfortunately, but there's still shame, right? There's still that. We live in a culture that thrives on the facade of competence and perfection. So anything that breaks that facade feels extremely vulnerable making. And we women want to be super women. We want to act like we got our shit together. So in this book, I talk about my own vulnerabilities and I was vulnerable to share my vulnerabilities. I'm like, why am I sharing myself? I didn't want to be the subject of judgment, but then I did because I realized that was just my ego and that was my facade. And if I don't share or women like you don't share, then we actually continue the oppression of the toxic patriarchy by by keeping it all suppressed. And we need to express ourselves so that we blast this facade. We break this image of being good, perfect superwomen. We need to cut it out. There is no such thing. There never was such a thing. So we're not even failing. There's nothing even to be vulnerable about when you're being real. So today, oh my today's, God. today's culture applauds when you're real. That's really a tragic thing when you get applauded for being real. The reason you, the reason we applaud each other for being basic, real, ordinary, average people is because there has been this superimposed idea that we're supposed to be super women perf- perfectionists. The, the, that's why bearing our truth is a maverick act today. It shouldn't right. be. 
it shouldn't be so maverick. It's hello, I'm average, aren't you? But no, we're all pretending like we got these supersonic lives. And, and that's what I wanted to blast in this book, my own ordinariness. Hello, I'm average. I'm an average chick. I like my average life. I'm happy with my ordinary life. But the word average, I purposely use it because people don't like that word. It's too average. It's too basic. Oh, I'm just one of the crowd. To the universe, we are not even a speck of a speck of a piece of dust. Like we need to wake up to our delusions of grandeur and cut it out because that's the cause of misery. So I'm saying it, I'm average. I want to be average. I don't want more. I want to get used to the word average because that's what we have been running away from. And we look at us, we're just people. Why do we want to be these automatons who have these robotic lives that, and robotic bodies that have no wrinkles? Every day I look at my wrinkles and I can hear my inner oppressor. And then I tell myself, cut it out. You're just a, an older woman now. Get used to it. Say hello to your wrinkles every day and begin to love them. But I can hear the cultural voice inside me saying, oh my God, go fill them up. Go fill them up. Yeah. And it is right. We start to get wrinkles. We start to get older. We start to gain weight and we are no longer valuable as women. The message is we're no longer valuable. Yeah, we all that says is that we can't maybe be fertile anymore in terms of babies. Mm -hmm. That's it. We've taken that to mean that we are not significant, not desirable. And also we have this pathology in us that if our men say we are in a heterosexual relationship, if the man looks at a younger woman, oh my God, now that means we have to be young too. And I try to teach women, it doesn't matter who he looks at. He's not your problem or your concern. He doesn't define you. Get rid of this idea that what men like, and I'm talking stereotypically, and I'm talking only about heterosexual relationships, please. Get off that and learn to embrace who you are. Don't blame your partner and don't cling to your partner. And your partner's free to look at whoever they want. It doesn't mean you have to change who you are. <laughs> Yes. This sort of brings me to the lie about love. Okay. And the lie, uh, lies about marriage and divorce in particular, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because we're, in we're talking about looking at the other person. What's he doing? What's he looking at? What is he, right? And the more that you fill yourself up, this is the radical awakening, right? The more that we awaken to our own selves and who we are, the more likely we are to choose a partner who's actually going to meet that energy and meet that love. And I feel like it's such a, it can be such a uh, cliche when we say you'll only, you can only love someone as much as you love yourself, or you're only going to attract love if you love yourself. And it's become a trope. And the truth is, if we are not radically awakened to our whole selves, we can't actually enter into a relationship with someone who isn't going to, is going to mirror that for ourselves. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And as much as it's a cliche, it's become a cliche because we keep talking about the importance of that. And so the lies that we've been told about love, especially as women, and again, I'm only talking about stereotypes and traditional heterosexual, but even same gendered relationships, same sex relationships, is that love has an agenda, meaning it has to be loyal to one person. It has to end up with a ring on the finger. It has to have a commitment, which looks in like a particular type of way with a contract. It has to end up in marriage. And th th that is just completely blasphemizing what love's true intention is. Because that's not love. That is, that's occupation of the other person. <laughs> right. Let's, yes. Let's occupy you. <laughs> mm -hmm. I love that word. That's so true. Right. It is. It is an occupation. <laughs> <laughs> Let me take over your whole life. Okay. <laughs> you from now on will think what I want. Look at only me or who I say you should look at and basically abide by me. How is it not a, a soldier in an army that you're recruiting? It's just, you don't tell them that. You don't right. say that. <laughs> but that's why you have a contract because you're like, oh, I love you so much, but I don't really trust you. And I don't really know if I trust myself. So we need the priest or the clergy to ensure that we stay together. If there's any sign of not love, it's that contract. 
Yes. Yeah. So this is one of the, the this is like the lies of, of about marriage, right? It's the idea that we go into marriage thinking it's like this loving, right? It's a loving thing, but it's actually, it's a legally, but it's, there's, there's a word that you use. Transaction. It's a transaction. Yeah, it is. Tr- it is a transaction and it's, yeah, and, it, and it, it is love, but it, the sentence has not, is not complete. It's love until the contract is broken. And if somebody breaks that contract, and of course, there are many things based on your own neuroses, how many things you add there. Somebody can break a contract because they looked at somebody. Somebody can break a contract if they call somebody. There are lovely, lovely things in that contract that you keep adding. And so if the contract is broken, you feel betrayed because not because that person doesn't love you. It's because they broke the contract, the conditions. And no one wants to admit this and no one, everyone will fight with me on this, but I've seen enough people and I've been through enough divorces with my clients like you have to see love fly out the window. And suddenly it's about betrayal and the, what the person owed me and how could he or she do this to me. And it's all about victimhood and perpetuation of my own martyrdom. And I'm not saying that there isn't such a thing as abuse. In my book, I talk about if you're being abused, this is not a conversation we need to have. You need to be out of there. I'm talking about how we co-create our own subjugation by giving power to people who we then allow to betray us. I talk about that no one can really betray us because our essence is unrejectable. At our essence, It's impossible for anyone to reject us. The only reason we feel rejected is because we don't live in essence. We ourselves are living shards of who we are. So the ego can be betrayed. The essence can never be betrayed. The essence is always whole. Sure, you can lose money, but that doesn't mean your essence is not whole. Sure, you can be told you're stupid, dumb, and fat, or whatever. That's all. Those are all words to the ego. The essence knows it is complete. The essence knows it will live with or without money. It will live with or without validation. It will live without $10,000. It can survive. It has faith or, or power in its resilience. Doesn't mean it's going to be easy, but it. But the essence cannot shatter. So if anyone has betrayed us, they have betrayed our, our ego's idea of what should have happened. Essence cannot be hurt. Sure, life does. it doesn't mean life is easy if you live in your essence. I live in my essence and I, my, people steal from me. People lie to me. Of course, that's human nature. But my essence doesn't get deterred. My essence doesn't lose alignment. And people can hurt you and you can be hurt, but it doesn't destroy, as you say, your essence. But if you really go deep, and I teach that in the book, you when you really examine what is being hurt, mm. ah, my expectations are being hurt. Mm-hmm. My, mm-hmm. My, fa- my fantasy just got dumped in the gutter. Ah, where did you have this fantasy from? Ah, I had it when I was a child and I had it because I w- wanted what I didn't have. Ah, okay. Let's re- get real about what's getting hurt, right? I'm telling you, your essence cannot get hurt. Your essence is so overabundant, but we don't live in essence. We live in expectation. Mm-hmm. We live in control. We live in transaction and we live in lack. So all of that is constantly getting hurt. Yes. <laughs> right. Yes. 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 I wanted I wanted to read a section. It's just a couple paragraphs from your book. Can I do that? Is that okay yeah. with you? And this is from the lies about marriage and divorce section. And I think my audience needs to hear this really well. Really needs to hear this. So you guys also need to buy the book, FYI. So you say that culture fosters a huge stigma against divorce in many cases, even when abuse is involved with the woman often being told by those she is close to that she shouldn't overreact by leaving the marriage. I hear this all the time. In fact, there are even mothers who encourage other women to accept their situations as they are, encouraging them to stay for the kids or for the sake of social inclusion, even if there is maltreatment or abuse. They might say something like, your kids will suffer, so it's better to stick it out. He didn't break your nose. At least he isn't a drug addict. He provides for you so well, so ignore the other stuff. Such suppression of our truth creates an inner split, and we stop trusting ourselves. Abandoning our inner knowing is the real trauma. We begin to second-guess our inner wisdom and doubt our judgment. And that right there... (laughs) 
for me is that's it. That's it. It creates an inner split and we stop trusting ourselves because we are told we are. And I hear this all day, every day, thousands and thousands of women in my Facebook group, my clients, messages I get all the time. He treats me like this. He does this to me. He does that. He does. He's like horribly abusive, but But, you know, but because we've been trained to step away from our knowing we've been trained to doubt ourselves that, but I wait for the, but I go, me too. Yep. Absolutely. They, they, they stand up at, in the audience and they go, Dr. Shafali. I go, yeah, I've already <laughs> yeah. heard the but. I already know the energy is to say but because we're trained to doubt ourselves because of all the stigma that we believe is true. So we have to learn to walk away from stigma. We have to learn to understand the purpose of stigma is to keep us in fear. And, and you have to reject stigma. You have to say, guess what, stigma? I see you. I know your purpose is to make me feel scared. I know you're actually in a weird way trying to protect me, but I don't need protection. I need to follow my own truth in this one life I have. And we have to dare to rebel against stigma because stigma is all around us, especially around mothers who want to leave a marriage. You're not allowed to even think that you are evil if you think that. That is the stigma. You're selfish. So selfish, so impetuous, so reactive, and and you should give it another chance. And over dramatic, over dramatic, <laughs> right. and, and 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 as if as if we mothers or women who leave a marriage would ever leave a marriage without one thousand reasons. Right, no, exactly. Right. No woman mm-hmm. has ever regretted. I doubt has ever said, you know what. I should have not left the marriage. Every woman goes through years of doubt. We have to honor those women who who dare to to leave a marriage. The minute, like uh, if a child says, I've been abused, you don't doubt that child. You say, holy cow, why would this child say that if it didn't happen, right? In the same way, if a woman is willing to break up a relationship and it's, it's been there for a few years, trust her honor her, that this is not being said out of any impetuousness or selfishness. Most of us women go the other way. We want to ignore ourselves. So if we are daring to say, hey, myself is not happy. Oh my goodness, trust her that herself is 1000 times more unhappy than she's even saying. Absolutely. Absolutely. 100%. we're always always going to water it down. We're always going to protect the others. That's our nature to protect others, to make others feel good, to save face. So if a woman says, I'm a little unhappy, oh my goodness, just trust her. That means she's a lot unhappy and she needs support. Exactly. Exactly. And I I think that's so true. I, the years of agonizing that we go through before we come to this decision. And then we finally feel in our hearts that like, this is what we have to do. And we've gone through all these years and then we tell people and then they shit on the decision. And then we have to defend ourselves in this way that just by the time we've gotten there, we're so tired. We've done so much work. We, we don't want to have to defend it again and again. We've already defended it to ourselves for so we've had to go oh through so goodness. much. I know. Like, we, and women do it to women. More, make us, more than anyone. More than I anyone. Know. Mm-hmm. Because I think it's because women are threatened by, by free women. Because they know how they are compromising and they are, quote unquote, sacrificing. So a lot of them feel first more superior because they are doing what the culture told them, sacrifice, compromise. It's hard work. You can't just escape this. So they think they're very moral by doing it. So one, they have some sanctimony about them, but a secret part of them, I believe, doesn't want to do it anymore. And is tired of doing all this compromising. So when a woman finally breaks free and says, F that, I'm not doing that anymore. We want to put her down because she's making us challenge ourselves and our own belief system, which said we should stick it out. Now she's defying that and that's making me uncomfortable. So I'm going to try to make her stick it out like me. Like me, exactly. I will tell you the two people that had the strongest, most emotionally charged reactions when I got divorced 
both of whom, by the way, really hated, didn't like my husband. Like it wasn't like they thought we had a good marriage, but they had these very strong, vicious responses. And both of them were divorced within the next year. And I always say that to my clients when they have someone having a really strong response. I always say similar to what you're saying. I said, there's, you are holding a mirror up to them that they do not want to look in and you're challenging their status quo. And I guarantee you within, within a year or so, it's all going to come out. (laughs) And it usually does because we also give them permission. We give them permission that they don't want. They don't want permission to leave. Yeah. They're hold they've been holding this all together for a really long time. <laughs> yes. It's just <clears throat> it's sad and it's not about competition or divorce is not the answer for every human being and neither is marriage. And as long as we can allow room for different expressions of uh of ex- of sexuality, of love, then we can all live and breathe a little easier. We shouldn't be scared to tell our sisters the truth about our regular life. And that's what I was talking about. We're so afraid to show up as regular because there's this idea, this facade that we're all playing into that we are perfect and we're better than the other. And it's such total nonsense, garbage. And we're all doing it to each other. Therefore, it takes the courage of one woman to say no more. And that's what this book, I hope, gives people the courage to say no more. I'm not playing this game anymore. You can play it. I'm not playing it. I love it. I hope so. I hope so. And I think it's, I think it's, it's brilliant and it's amazing and, and important. And I think we're, I think we're, I think also as women, I think we're ready for this. We've been feeling this for so long. I think we're finally ready to do the work, right. To do the inner work and shed all this stuff. I really do. I think we're ready. Yeah. And each person arrives at a different place of readiness and there are many layers to unpeel, but The time is now. So if people are hearing this and resonating, nothing is stopping them to begin that unfolding process. So Dr. Shafali, thank you. Where can people buy the book? It is coming out next week, but they can pre-order it right now. If they pre-order it right now, I can get, I almost guarantee Amazon and other bookstores send it out right away. Like many people tell me that they get it on release day. I'm also doing a 10 day deep dive course and hundreds of women have signed up for it. And if they sign up for the course, they get three books with the course. So if you go to aradicalawakening.com, you can either sign up for the course or buy the book there. And there are lots of indie bookstores there. So if you order your copy right now, you should get it really soon. Oh, that's exciting. What's the 10-day course? Will you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. So it's called a 10-day deep dive into your radical awakening. And I want people to almost do the course before they read the book, because I get them ready to understand the language, the pace, the rhythm of the book. And we're going to do practical work together as a community. And it's 10 days straight, because I believe if you just piggyback off each day, the momentum builds and the energy for change gets catalyzed. So it's a really cool course I've created on the themes of the book. So then when you read the book slowly on your own, it's already going to sink in. I'm going to break the first barrier through the course, and then your own reading will allow it all to permeate. That's amazing. So when does the course begin? It begins in two weeks, in May 23rd. So just right after the book gets released, we launch into the course. Making a note of that. Uh-huh. <laughs> so all, all the information is at eradicalawakening.com. Great. That's perfect. And is it going to be, that's, so that's online. And is it going to be in a Facebook group, that kind of thing? Facebook group, online, Great. and all recordings sent to you for life. Love it. And you get three books included in the cost of the ticket. Awesome. Okay, great. Dr. Shefali, this has been such, such a pleasure. I I adore your work. I support your work. I shout it from the rooftops. And I'm so happy to have had you on the podcast to talk about your new book. Thank you so much for having me. Thanks for tuning in to another episode of the Divorce Survival Guide podcast. If you like what you hear, head on over to Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen in and leave me a review. And don't forget to follow me on Instagram at The Divorce Survival Guide. I'll see you next time. And until then, remember, you, my love, deserve to be happy.